Oh. Am I able to share my screen? It's saying the host is disabled participant okay. sharing screen. Okay, I will figure that out. Okay. And then I'll just, yeah, launch straight into it. Sorry, how do I do that? It would be one of these settings. Right. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I'll hand over to Stephen. Thank you. So yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me uh, on the call. So yeah, my name is uh, Stephen Cantwell. I'm manager of vice services at FMG Insurance. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go into a bit of detail in terms of what exactly I, I do in my role and um, yeah, how that I'm, I'm hoping that the, the purpose of today is, is by sharing that um, you can have a bit of a, an understanding of, of, of what I do and then how you know, some of uh, the data that we use um, can be used to provide some um, insights and statistical um, supports for any communication uh, for farmers and growers. Um, so before I'm going to go into that sort of uh, that sort of things, I'll, I'll just give a bit of background um, in for FMG for those of you who don't know, because I think it's a really important factor to understand uh, where FMGs come from uh, and uh, to to where it is today, and and that really sort of explains why we do what we do. Um, so the the first thing I'll go through is just um, you know what our, our our vision and and mission statement. So our vision statement is to help uh, helping to build strong and prosperous rural communities, and then our mission statement is to to, prov to um, provide a better deal for rural New Zealand. So that can sort of seem um, you know quite a bit abstract, but I guess when you look at our history, it makes a lot of sense. So FMG is a um, is a mutual group. Um, so what that means is that we are owned by our members. So it operates similar to a to a cooperative, um, in the sense of uh, that you know we are member owned. But um, when it was started 116 years ago by a group of farmers who got um, tired of uh, the English uh, insurers back there charging big premiums and not understanding the risks, they decided to create their own insurance company for farmers, and well, and, and which was um, the, the mutuals. And so what that means is no one has put any capital in FMG. So we actually don't have any uh, shareholders which we have to pay out. So any time that we make a, um, any time when we make a, a profit, that that stays in the business to prepare for that next big event, that next Kaikoura or or big um, hailstorm. Uh, and and it also goes through to sponsorship of events from um, from the grassroots for your local calf club. Uh, right through to um, you know young farmer of the year and supporting that next generation of of um, farmers and growers. So um, and because of that, we're able to also um, you know do a little bit of um, advice. And so if you see our logo, you'll see that there's the advice and insurance. Most people are pretty familiar with the insurance aspect out of it. I mean that's our that's our transaction, um, but the advice element is actually what we lead with. This is the this is the part that we actually start the conversation with. Um, and and what we try and do is provide specialized advice to help our clients make informed decisions in order to avoid loss and minimize disruption. And so we use um, when when you look at uh, the whole sort of risk management process, there's there's really three key steps there to to simplify. There's sort of the identifying and assessing what are the what's the probability and the impact of something, and then you go through to managing it. So most people sort of think of um, you know uh, what we do is mostly in this transfer area. So that's that is in in the insurance element part, um, you know, part of uh, managing risk, where you actually pay someone to take that risk for you. So if you've got a, um, you know, you got a house, you, you're paying someone um, else to take that risk on for you when you buy insurance. Um, to, uh, you know, that that if there is that fire, that they'll pay for it. So that's actually transferring that risk to your insurer. But there's a whole range of other steps which um, which we try and use as well. Because uh, really, insurance is is only one of those, and and ideally, it's um, you try and to prevent those um, uh, losses from happening, rather than just having a um, a cure at the end of it in in the form of insurance. And of course, you 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 always review this, you know, constantly monitoring, recording, and and partnering with other organisations. So we we divide risk into three different areas. 
Um, so there's the physical um, or the three buckets, sorry. Um, so there's the physical, which is the, probably the one that we're most familiar with. This is the tangible parts. Um, things like, as you can see there in the list, things like tractor fires or, or you know, something getting burgled or something like that. That That is what we'd put in our physical one. The operational is when we get really into the legislative side of, um, of, of uh, farming and, um, you know, the sort of uh, things like yeah, health and safety, resource management, animal welfare, uh, the, all those different things uh, are in that sort of uh, operational risks as well. Uh, then we move to the key person, which is last here, but definitely not least. And that's actually the fact that uh, for a lot of farms, uh, the people, uh, there's a lot of owner operators. And if, and if that one person um, was, you know, had uh, an injury or, or got, uh, you know, really sick or, 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 or passed away, uh, then, um, you know, you sort of, you sort of got a big gap in the business and, and it becomes quite difficult to, to operate. So the next thing I want to move on to is, uh, I guess, what specifically uh, myself and, and my and, and my team, what, what we do, uh, and that is that we are constantly looking at our claims data so that we can help provide better advice uh, for our clients. So FMG insures over half of New Zealand's farmers and growers, which is a huge proportion of, of market share for, for any business, let alone insurance. But what this means is that we, we see a lot of different claims um, come through. And, um, and so what we get here is like, if we just imagine each of these little um, dots as a claim. Uh, so what, what we're doing is looking through it and sorting through it. So we'll use these dark, um, these dark green ones as an example, and we'll, we'll pretend they're quad bike claims. So we're, we're, we're sorting through all these claims, trying to find uh, what, what they are. Uh, and then we'll, um, we'll group them together so we'll get all the quad ones, pull them together, and then we'll we'll sort of spread them out and refine into an insight. And the end result looks a bit like this. So this is one that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, what we saw for the amount of quad bike uh, um, claims that we get. So you can see that, um, you know, there's, there's a range of different things from fires, um, um, theft, but the biggest run is is rolling and, and what we call park and roll, which essentially just le uh, um, leaving the handbrake off. So you can see there, that's a, uh, there's a massive proportion there of it, of them actually just being rolled. So this is when people are actively riding the bike and rolling. And so this is, this was quite concerning for us, uh, particularly, um, uh, you know, when we when we think about the human impact of that. So that $12.5 million, it's absolutely, it's significant. You know, we would love to reduce that, but it's actually the community element, the fact that every time one of these are rolling, there's, a, there's that serious risk of someone being, um, you know, injured badly or worst case scenario fatality. Uh, and that that really became a big focus for us. And that goes back again to that, that vision um, statement of, of growing strong and prosperous rural communities, we're thinking, well, how can how can we be strong and prosperous if we're if we're losing on you know average I think it's about five um, people in our farming community every single year from a preventable death, and so we sort of moved really in, into this area, um, and we're able to sort of break down um, all the different claims into different regions. Uh, but what we really, the next real big step that we always take is, is we actually want to influence the future. So we don't just want to go, okay, yet yeah, we can see where this is coming from, let people know about it and sit in our hands. We actively get in there and we, and we um, sort of um, actually sort of help our clients along with that journey. So we always take the approach of we're always looking at the um, most research shows that farmers like to learn in three different areas. So they like to learn um, from practical, hands-on um, uh, teaching or uh, also um, demonstrations. So being shown how to do something and peer learning. So farmers learning from other farmers. And so this one here is, is actually a series of uh, quad bike and side by side workshops that, that we run throughout the country. At this stage, it's quite low numbers where we sort of do roughly about um, nine to 10 a year. Uh, but they're quite targeted in terms of the, the regions uh, which, which we're looking at. And so these, um, these uh, so farmers bring their own quad bike or their own side by side and, they act, and we, we get in these expert trainers uh, called Natural Instincts, the, the business is called, and, and they actually run through 
uh, some of the um, some of the parts of actually how to how to ride a quad. And this is designed for experienced riders. This is not you know one on one how to ride a quad. This is actually some real sort of you know that for that advanced level of riding. Uh, because our clients, are, most of them have been riding quads their whole life, but, you know, they've never had, uh, you know, they've never been taught how to actually ride it. There's no license um, process. You just sort of jump on it as, when you're young and and you just learn as you go. So you don't know the bad habits you don't ha that you have. Uh, and we're getting some really good feedback from the from clients uh, on this. And um, one thing that we've actually learned quite a bit is, you know, we're, the, the workshops are really designed for those, uh, sort of, um, you know, hand uh, for the for the active writing part of it. But one of the big feedbacks we always get is how clients. Um, one of the big things they learn is actually the importance of tire pressure, uh, which is it seems quite basic. But uh, when when they go through and check everyone's tire pressures, it's they're they're all over the shop. There's there's some that you know we get a, a quad and it's got um, four different pressures in each of the wheels. Uh, and, and people just like they just jump on the quad every day and they don't feel those sort of small differences uh, that, you know, if it's, um, you know, deflating, uh, um, you know, on a on a day to day basis, it's sort of like watching your watching your hair grow. You don't notice it if you're looking at it every day. But if, um, you know, you haven't been on the quad for a while, then you jump on it, then you sort of. Uh, you sort of notice that difference. So th those as well, like there's some things that we learn from these experience actually getting in there hands on uh, for ourselves that we're able to communicate the messages because uh, when someone calls up to make a claim, um, that's that's the sort of all the information that we get. So uh, something like tire pressure, that's not something someone would um, say when they make a claim. So we're, we're always learning in these areas and, and, we, and then we use that for the messages. I've got uh, another example um, just to again show you, I guess, the, the power of, of, of being able to um, have this data and, and then try and um, try and change the future. So this is um, this is quite a success story that we had. So uh, this is uh, tractor fires. Uh, you know, these cause huge amounts of damage. Um, you know, tractors are expensive pieces of equipment. And once the fires get going, it doesn't take a lot to, for the whole thing to burn down. As you can see here, you know, there's pretty much not much left at all. So this is, and this is really up-to-date data. This is 2018 to 2020, three years um, accumulated every month, um, how many claims we're getting. So you can see there, it's sort of, you know, it's quite steady, you know, sort of low around that 20 mark. And then September, October, it just skyrockets up. And it just like, and that is the same, because this is three years um, with data. It's, you know, we are seeing this, you know, pretty much every year. And so the big cause of this is um, in spring is is bird's nest. So, uh, you know, uh, the a tractor engine provides a, a quite a good environment for um, creating nests. It's dark, it's enclosed, it's protected from the elements. So birds love it. They, you know, this is a particularly starlings love to get in there and create a nest. But unfortunately, that's what happens is when the engine starts getting warm, that nest heats up and it combusts, and 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 that's all it takes to. Um, to turn the tractor in, into into this. So this was, and this is, um, so in 2010, uh, they they launched the the stop and pop campaign, uh, and and um, for the advice team at FMG. And so this was just basic, you know, stickers about reminding to before you uh, start on the start the tractor, stop, pop the bonnet, check for bird's nest. That's all it is, just some stickers. We did a few radio ad campaigns and a few, um, you know, a few articles and things like that about, you know, how we're, how we're seeing these claims. And, you know, this was simply behavioral change, no technology at all, just, you know, as I said, just the stickers as a reminder. And, you know, this is just a rough estimate, um, but it's quite a conservative figure. But, you know, we were getting about two and a half million dollars in claims every year. Uh, and so you can see there in that sort of 2009, 2010, and straight after stop and pop, uh, we started seeing big declines. And we estimate that, you know, it's around about that $2.6 million um, in, in claims saved. We'd actually probably expect that line without it to be a little bit, um, a little with a bit of an incline there, just as, um, you know, we were growing quite rapidly during this period. Um, so we probably would have got even more, but as a conservative figure, 2.64 million. 
So what's the point of all that, I guess, is, you know, so what, the, the insurance business uh, saves a heap of money, but no, that's, I mean, again, it goes back to the being a mutual. So when you're, so what, what our goal is, um, is that we can, if we can provide good advice, we can lower claims, which then lowers the claims costs. And then we can, the goal is to stabilize premium. Um, and so because we're a mutual, and again, we don't have those shareholders, um, we're, we're a profit making business. So we need to be profit making to be, you know, to be sustainable, but we're not a profit maximizing business. Because if we maximize our profit to, you know, um, uh, to the full capability, there's, I mean, there's, there's no point if we, if we can't help our clients more. And so the idea is, is that if we can stay, if we can lower those claims costs, then we'll stabilize the premium. It might not feel like that at the moment. I guess with so you know, the you know impact of so many weather events that we've had lately, and 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 natural disasters, hailstorms. You know, we we are seeing across the board insurance becoming more expensive. But if we can help prevent those um, those preventable uh, claims from happening, then we can start sort of making an impact um, on on at least keeping those premiums stable. Uh, and, and making sure that insurance can be something that's affordable and accessible uh, to all our farmers and growers. So I, I guess um, one thing I'll just also want to show, I guess, uh, is how, you know, how this can be used uh, in, in, in journalism. Uh, and so I guess for, for probably a lot of people listening, some might have a national footprint while some might have a regional uh, footprint, depending on you know, the publication that you're on. And so we've got, um, we're able to actually go through um, and find in terms of the regional breakdown uh, of these claims. But the other thing that we can do is for if you're in a smaller region, like say you're not in the Canterbury or Waikato where they're always sort of at the top because they're just big, big farming regions, is we can actually break down into um, what we call relative uh, claims. So the, the um, bars on the um, right hand side here in the dark green is the amount that, you know, the proportion that we've got insured. So uh, if we look at Waikato, um, we've got 17.1% of our tractors are all insured in Waikato. And 17.1% of all the claims are coming from there. So that's that's exactly perfect proportion of what we'd expect. Say Tasman, uh, just as an example, got 2.4% of tractors there, but they're only getting 1.9% of the claims. So we'd say that is underrepresented. So they're getting not as many claims as they should, as as they as they would do an uninsured. So they actually uh, that's a it, they're performing quite well. Uh, but we can see here when we look at West Coast, Taranaki, Southland, and Otago that is what we we see is overrepresented. So when we're looking at what we can do. Um, you know, they're, they're right up there um, in terms of the regions we want to focus on. You can see some here like Canterbury is slightly over, but that's really just 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 ticking over. Like it's still in that sort of vicinity that it, it's more or less what it should be. But these ones here are the ones in red. They're the regions that we're going, yeah, these are the ones we want to focus on. Southland in particular, I don't know what it is um, for tractors in Southland, but they're always one that are that that's right up there, and it's actually come down a little bit, but it's still overrepresented. So the the, the benefit of all this is um, we're uh, because we you know we do have that big market share of over you know uh, half of farmers and growers is that we're really transparent with being able to share these insights because you know if if we if if something like this uh, gets um, you know published and and farmers are reading it and they they they're getting some good insights they they're learning things out of it there's a 50/50 chance that they're one of our clients and even if they're not we're still looking at that industry good we're looking at growing strong and prosperous rural communities that's not strong and prosperous rural communities only for our clients that's for all rural communities so and every member within them so we're always looking at ways that we can help um, our, our claims data might not have the answer to everything. We do get questions and sometimes we can't see everything because we can only see the information that we see when, um, when we insure it or when that claim is lodged. But if there is somewhere where we can help, um, then we will. And um, yeah, and, I, if, and I'm sure, um, you know, Claire, uh, who I work with very closely, um, she's, um, you know, if, if you get in contact with her, if you're, 
if you're writing a story about um, you know vehicles or something that we or theft or something that we might claim on, we're always um, happy to happy to share that. Uh, one other, th I'm just going to quickly touch on. A f I won't go into too much detail as I know I've been sort of rambling on for a while, but um, there's just a couple of things I want to also touch on, and that is that. Uh, you know, we're also looking in, you know, into the, you know, we look quite a bit in the past for our claims, but also looking into the future of what are some of the up and coming risks as well. And these might not be, uh, some of these we do ensure, some of them we don't, um, you know, but that again, you know, we're not just, uh, it's all about the holistic sort of risk for our clients. It's not just about insurance covers, um, but this is one that we, that we do ensure. Um, and this is the, the, the directors and officers responsibility. So uh, what we're seeing is we're starting to see if, uh, you know, a, a, um, you know the, for a lot of our clients, we're seeing more and more of them uh, becoming limited liability companies. Uh, so they, they, they're operating companies and they, they, have, they become a director. Uh, and so it's not that crazily uncommon to see, um, you know, a, a family farm, uh, where you know you got mum and dad, and then you got a couple of kids, and they're they're all listed as directors. Uh, but when you become a director or an officer, you you start taking on a whole bunch of other risks uh, because you've got extra responsibilities. And so when and this is something that's quite well known in in, in other businesses, particularly big um, corporations, where. Um, you know, that is, you know, that that's the norm, you know, that's why we have to take minutes, that's why we have to have formal meetings, write down the thinking process of decision making. But for a lot of farms, they might not actually understand the responsibilities they've taken on uh, when they become that, um, the, their director. So often, um, you know, people think of this as the boardroom, uh, you know, they're sort of very corporate, you know, big desks. But this as well is also the boardroom. And this is this is probably the boardroom for a lot of farmers and growers throughout New Zealand is, is this sort of kitchen table. Um, but it's just as important as um, you know, any other business is that they go through the right processes. They understand um, the, the, the responsibilities that they've taken on and, and they're able to sort of prepare themselves and operate like um, any other um, company. So that's one I just wanted to touch on because we are expecting to see more and more of these coming through. The other one is connectivity. So we're seeing um, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot more sort of data, a lot more um, technology being used on farms. I mean, Fonterra have got these new VAT monitors which connect to the internet that have been rolled out. So that's uh, eighty percent of um, dairy farmers are going to have at least some connect um, c connection to the internet. Uh, and which is great. And technology is something that we should embrace. This is this is the way we have to be. We have to be smarter on how we use our land for a range of different reasons, from productivity to environmental concerns. All these reasons we need to keep making sure that we embrace technology. However, again, this is something that you know. Although it's there, there's a lot of benefits there. We also need to be aware of the risks that are taking on, uh, and that really relates to cybersecurity. Uh, so we've had a, a few incidences um, where uh, our clients have had uh, breaches. Um, so uh, where they've been hacked, we've had uh, uh, cow sheds, which have had um, malware um, put on it, a, a type, a specific type of ransomware, which is uh, where the cow shed has actually been locked um, down uh, and they, they demand, um, the hackers are demanding a ransom to be paid. Otherwise, they, um, it stays that, you know, that it stays locked. Uh, we've also had an instance of um, uh, an invoice, um, uh, so it, what's called invoice fraud. So our, uh, our you know, the um, farmer receives a uh, invoice. Uh, they see the account number; it's paid. Um, but what's happened along the way is someone's intercepted that, um, and they've changed the the account number, and so the invoice is paid to the wrong account. Uh, and then that that money just vanishes, like it just disappears overseas. It gets transferred, all arranged. And we've had some quite significant, um, uh, quite a significant example of of a client uh, paying big sum of money, um, and that money was vanished overnight. Uh, and luckily, there's there's been a lot of work to be able to um, from experts. Uh, this is outside of us to be able to sort of you know help retrieve, but. This is becoming a bigger and bigger thing, uh, and the you know because I guess we're as you know the ag industry we're used to being 
uh, in an isolated country, in an isolated environment that we think we're safe, but with the internet, we're just as connected as anyone in an urban um, centre in, uh, in, in a super city. Uh, but the good thing is about this is that there is a lot of things that you can do. And so we've been sort of pushing a lot of the messages which CERT and Z have. Uh, and this is the Com Computer Emergency Response Team New Zealand. And they've got the 11 tips for cybersecurity. And a lot of experts we've talked to uh, say that if you can do this, you're well, you're well on the way to be able to be, you know, as secure as you can get. And a lot of these things, um, I'm not going to go through them now, but I can, um, you know, certain Zeb's website's brilliant. They've got some excellent resources out there. Um, but if you can do all these, you no longer are that easy target. And that's the big thing that we're trying to get um, across with our clients is, is that, um, you know, this can take you, depending on your computer literacy, it could be a couple of hours um, and, and, and it's all done. And then, you, and then you're, you know, you, you're no longer that easy target. The one other one that I'll just touch on is um, biosecurity, and that is more, uh, you know, biosecurity is always seen as one of the biggest risks that face um, uh, rural New Zealand. I guess just, to, you know, the, the impact it would have on production and, and, and people, and we're seeing that with um, mycoplasma bovis, we're seeing it with PSA, it's, it's you know, it's, a, it's a quite a significant thing. But what we're what we're saying what we're seeing more of and expecting to see even more so is the shift away from biosecurity just being a thing at the border, uh, with um, you know it's just an issue it's just a thing for MPI you know which was a lot of it thought and there was this you know internally uh, in New Zealand stock flowed through you know quite transparently but we're gonna we're expecting to see even more so uh, biosecurity being an on farm thing at the farm gate not just on the border. So um, there, so they're probably the three points I just wanted to say in terms of things that we're, you know, we're also looking at in the future. Some of these we can see with claims creeping up and examples, and then there's some that it's just with our interaction as, as we, we consider ourselves to be sort of, you know, we're not the experts in everything in farming, but we are the experts of risk and how to think about risk and approach it. And that's where we see that we can add real big value into these things that are on the horizon, as opposed to waiting for it to become an issue and then addressing it. So just to just to summarise, um, so yeah, there's uh, you know we 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 do have a, a range of different um, you know sort of uh, pieces of data that we can use and that we're happy to share as long as it's for the benefit of of uh, um, you know rural New Zealand and um, and then we've also got things that we're looking at in the future um, and and you've got some examples of cases we're happening but then there's also our just our interaction. Uh, in in the industry and and our um, and our capability to think of risk and 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 how to approach it. Uh, so that that's all the content I've got. Um, but happy for any any questions as well. Well, that was incredibly helpful. Um, I was really interested in the um, the rolling of um, quad bikes. I've never been on one, and they terrify me. So. Yeah. Yeah, I feel somewhat comforted that, um, yeah, that my reluctance to go on a quad bike has been confirmed. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one, quad bikes. I mean, they, they um, you know, they're extremely popular uh, tools in, in Australia and New Zealand for farming, um, but they weren't actually designed for that. In, you know, they, for a, in a lot of places, they're simply just a recreational uh, vehicle. Um, but uh, yeah, it just happens to be adapted into a into a farming tool, which is um, very convenient. But it is yeah, it is something that you need to be um, quite aware of. And um, and we see like one I think one in five of our quad bike accidents happen when um, our clients are, are multitasking because there's so many different things going on on the go. You know, you got stock moving. Uh, you're trying to focus on on where you're going. And then, um, you know, that's when that's when all the accidents happen. OK, so we've got Jackie and Lauren on the phone. Jackie or Lauren, do you have any questions that you want to? Oh, we've got one in the chat. Um, so the question from Jackie is, are there, are there also positives to the growth and connectivity, e.g. have claims for milk spoilage dropped since Fonterra brought in the new milk vet monitoring? And new chilling rules. Yeah, so we we haven't seen uh, any drops yet for the um, uh, for those VAT monitors. Uh, where that's something that we're we're looking at uh, quite uh, closely. 
Um, but yeah, we haven't seen that shift yet. I mean, there's still, I think this is the last month that the rollout is uh, is happening, but we'd probably need an, at least the whole next season to start being able to see if there's any changes. Um, probably the new chilling rules has probably put even more pressure uh, on, because uh, one, one thing we do see a lot uh, for, for milk is um, our uh, chiller breakdown, uh, which we particularly see a big spike in, in summer. So these are, um, you know, often when it's peak milk, so there's a lot of milk in the vat and the weather's warmer. Uh, and then we've got the extra, you know, the new chilling rules. So these these equipment are working real hard. Um, and, the, and and so what, what this means is that if maintenance hasn't been done or there's any issues with this gear, it, we tend to find that that's when something will go wrong is, is, is in that summer period. Uh, so there, there, there is definitely a, a possibility that we might see a change. Um, but yeah, I, we, the, the, the use of technology is, is something that we hope um, will definitely have a positive benefit uh, on, on the claims and also for safety as well, uh, you know, for, for farmers and growing. So it'll be interesting to see that, but I don't have the answer yet, Jackie, but hopefully we'll see, um, you know, we definitely, milk is something that we look at on a yearly basis. We pay about four and a half million a year in it. Um, so it's something real quite significant for us and also really important for the dairy industry to keep on top of these things. So, um, yeah, haven't seen the changes yet, but we will be keeping a close eye on it. Thanks, Stephen. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm just going to say, uh, are there other growth, other sort of connectivity or technology advances that you guys are tracking that maybe will play into some of those areas where you have um, identified as high risk. I'm just thinking maybe, you know, better access to um, weather station uh, type uh, information where farmers can, you know, make decisions because they've, they've got more clarity around what the weather's going to do. Um, you know, those sort of things It must be, you must be sort of tracking other technological advances, are you? Yeah, so I guess on the, the, the weather one, um, probably one example of that is uh, like with irrigation. So uh, for, for irrigators, we, we particularly in um, Canterbury and, um, and Otago, wind is a massive risk for our clients. Uh, for, you know, so the wind pressurises on the Alps and then blows down and, and can easily knock over um, irrigators. And so yeah, we so with the like the the technology development now is is really good in in irrigation to um because we we always tell our clients point park and anchor so when there's big winds coming um you know point it into the wind park it there and anchor it down with a with a weight um to to help prevent the um you know wind uh blowing over the irrigator uh, but now you know there's there's technology available where you can actually set that position so you're not physically you know moving the irrigator you just simply hit a button and it will move into that point position where you want it to be uh all these all these things like particularly with weather um it's still there's still a human element to it uh you know technology can help reduce and help make it easier but it's that the big decisions that need to be made that really influence it so that example um you know we've, we've been talking about point park and anchor for a while while now we're sort of getting into the process of talking about planning because someone still needs to make that decision because there's a cost involved in all these decisions like in terms of productivity so who's making that call uh, you know who's who if who's the sort of what's the line of command um, in terms of if that person's away who's making it are you practicing it are new staff aware of these processes all those things are where we're sort of um, focusing on to make sure that we can get the most out of those technology I haven't really seen in in my time any sort of um, golden you know this any silver bullet to anything um, but you know we we get a lot of people who do approach us. Um, you know, asking about, you know, uh, you know, would we be interested in, in you know, particular pieces of technology? We see our role as in terms of helping provide that data and then being able to see, which, you know, again, we're quite transparent on, uh, to be then for people to be able to identify what the issues are and then how to address it. But, um, you know, we, we do sort of hear quite a few things floating through, um, but in terms of reaching to market, um, haven't, you know, there's, haven't had really a, a big massive one that's um, you know meant to solve all issues yet, but that that the um, milk um, the vat monitors will be a really interesting one uh, to see because that's got widespread uptake. Yep. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. 
I thought it was interesting your how much progress you made in bringing claims down from your stop and pop campaign. That's great, isn't it? And I guess it's a real seasonal issue. What will be your next focus um, on getting those claims down? I've noticed a, on a, a few dairy farms I've been on that the farmers get their staff to uh, leave the put the bonnet up when when they get out of the tractor, just over that period. So when the next person comes along, they have to check because they have to put the bonnet down before that's they right. ship the tractor. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a really good example, and that can, again goes to the that process where they've got this policy now on their property yeah. to always leave it open. Yeah. Um, and stop and pops one that it's a lot of these things take a lot of there's a long tail to it. Mm -hmm. Takes a long time to sort of see these things flow through, um, and you know that that one's been you know we've been talking about that for ten years now, yeah. uh, and that's where it gets that real cut through. I mean, we've got. Um, a lot of the ones that we're focusing on is particularly in the the farm vehicles and the accidents. Um, so that that's a really big one. But there's, I mean, that that stop and pop one was it was a really clear example of of something that can easily be influenced. But something when it becomes a part of driving skills or um, or you know how to use your vehicles, that the complexity starts to increase. So there's not that real clear cut easy solution. Um, but it's still you know where it takes time. So. Uh, you know, we've got a few things um, sort of on uh, up and coming, like with, uh, you know, where with the um, that tire pressures I was talking about, where we're looking to actually get some um, digital tire ga gauges in, which we can, you know, uh, um, pass on to clients through our team uh, and and use that as the starting point of that discussion around tire pressure, uh, and then they've actually got the gauge there ready to go. Um, but uh, a few other things that we, we do is um, we do a lot of different workshops. So an example of one is um, uh, with our crime. So we've got quite good um, uh, rural crime statistics, um, given that most people make a claim when they get robbed. And so we have actually we, we've partnered with uh, uh, New Zealand Police and uh, Federated Farmers. And we, we run a series of different workshops in, across New Zealand. Um, and, we, and, we, and we sort of talk through uh, you know, how, how to sort of approach some of these things, simple tips you can do for not only your own property, but for the whole uh, community. Because a lot of these things like crime in particular need to be community led. Um, and that, that, that we, you know, we get some really good engagement from that. We get, um, you know, sometimes we have these workshops, farmers are always hard to get on off farm, but we get sometimes, you know, 80 or 80 plus people uh, are there sort of attending which is extremely positive, but um, you know all these things are, is sometimes it's not always that clear cut example uh, um, like stop and pop. But our it's a long term game, and the sort of trends we're seeing in some of the areas that we focus on, we're seeing quite good like just steady decreases in in the amount of claims that we're getting, which we're which is really positive, particularly for yeah things like um, yeah the quads tractors uh, and there's uh, house fires as well is another big one which we do a lot of work with fire and emergency New Zealand as well. Right. Um, so, yeah, so that's all is I don't have like, that's, it's quite a nice, easy one that stop and pop and so it's a good example of yeah. that, of the power. Um, but yeah, a lot of these things is a long-term game, um, but we, we, we don't sort of, yeah, we don't have like one thing we're focusing on uh, because of that, but we keep an eye on that seasonality. Um, so different, different things. We see peaks in different parts of the year. And when I'm working with Claire and we're talking about what sort of things are we going to put in our, um, you know, our FMG post or on as a press release, we're always focusing on things that are really timely and also things that are practical. So things like at the moment, um, you know, we are probably a little bit past it now. I think we just we've just done some on for house fires. We're talking about because um, most rural rural uh, houses uh, use the fireplace. Um, in terms of you know just just getting it sweeped and and getting it clean, getting your your fire guard ready, uh, and and that's quite timely. You know, as we're approaching winter, when these are going to be um, up and running, you know, now's the chance you can influence it. Um, but you know, actually, we see that peak of claims in June, July. But we're we're talking about it now because this is the time that you can actually change that. So yeah. the seasonality is a is a huge factor in in when we when we time what we'll say. Do you um are you able to track the stats on your um of people insuring quad bikes and has there been a rise in it seems to me this a bit of a move into um, more side by side vehicles rather than the quad bikes because of these worries about um accidents as well as the fact they're pretty expensive to run and maintain and stuff have you noticed any trend like that 
Yeah, we haven't seen much of a decrease in the actual quads. Quads have stayed pretty steady, but we've definitely seen a big increase in the amount of side by sides. Right. Oh, yeah. So I think in the past five years, it's just it's roughly about double the amount that you know that's quite a long period, five years, and and we're yeah. a growing growing business. Um, but you know we have seen that or you know pretty much double. Uh, so that's quite significant, um, and that's one thing that we're as as we as that pool of side by sides is getting bigger. Then we've got more data to to um, pull off and what's going to be quite interesting is when we start looking to compare quads against side by sides and what are the sort of accidents that we're seeing in these yeah cool thank you okay well if there aren't any more questions we might wrap it up for today but thank you so much for speaking today Stephen and I'll send you a link when the video is up on YouTube channel um, and Jackie's just asked if she can have your email address. Yep. So absolutely. we'd like to contact you about a story. Yep. Brilliant. And then Claire.